Hello and welcome to the Lessons Podcast. This week, Jay sits down with professional football player Max Deich. At just 19, Max has made his way through the academies and now plays for the first team at Northampton Town Football Club. He talks with Jay about the mindset needed to succeed in a professional sports environment, as well as the tactics he's used to overcome early adversity and setbacks in his career. Max also touches on the positives and negatives associated with having a parent who's involved with the highest levels of football in England. This is a fantastic episode in which you'll learn what it takes mentally and physically to become a pro footballer. But before we begin, I would just like to ask our listeners to follow our podcast if you're listening along on Spotify and subscribe uh, if you're listening on YouTube. As a new podcast, this really helps us. But otherwise, uh, sit back and enjoy. Max, thanks for joining me today, mate. Um, so our first question, as always, is what is the most important lesson you've ever learned? I'd say it's believe in yourself because no one else will. Cool. So you've got to really, you got to really, I think that if you don't, if you, if you, if you ain't got any self-belief, any self-confidence, you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to back yourself. You've got to trust yourself in all situations. Cool. Agree. Um, so could you just give us a little intro on yourself, who you are, what you do? Uh, well, my name is Max Deitch. Um, 19 years old, centre back for Northampton Town. Uh, well, striker as well at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, you know, I've been at Northampton since I was uh, how old was I? nine. So, yeah, about 10 years is sort of my 10th year. Um, come all the way through the academy, scholarship, everything like that. Um, and yeah, I'm starting, well, I'm about a third of the way through my second year professional contract. So. Cool. Um, so, when did you start playing football and um, when did you? first sort of think it could be a career for you? Um, I started playing football well. My dad put a ball at my feet before I could walk, which always helps. Um, so yeah, probably, you know, three or four years old, just playing primary school rec football. Um, tennis was actually my major sport. Really? For football, yeah. I was playing um, I was playing tennis sort of as my priority sport until I was about 12. Yeah. And then came a decision where I... And, you know, I sat down with my parents like, okay, what do I really want to do? Um, and chose football sort of naturally, really. It just yeah. came more natural, I think, that I really enjoyed being part of the team and, you know, having that sort of group mentality. I thought being on your own, you know, it could be a bit isolating. Yeah, everything's on you, which means everything's great when it's on you, but everything's also horrendous when it's on you. So, um, no, naturally I followed in Dad's footsteps and have sort of chose that career path around 12-ish. Okay. Sort of thought, right, I've got to really drive for this now. Mm-hmm. And when, at what point did you think, like, this could be a career for me, I could actually take this to professional? Um, I always, once I made that decision, I always thought that I'd have an opportunity to. Okay. Um, yeah, I just thought, I can't, I've got to put all my eggs in one basket, there's no point half assing it. Mm-hmm. So, from that point onwards, was everything was football. So, yeah. you know, eat, sleep, breathe football. Um, okay. So, yeah, it was just going through the academy with that mentality and, and pushing every day, really. Cool. Well, um, what's like the contract sort of stuff like? Do you get like an academy contract and then like upgraded to a sort of full time professional one? Uh, so, when you uh, go through 16, so when you do GCSEs, they offer you a scholarship. Yeah. Uh, it's all like standardised across the EFL, so everyone's on pretty much the same. Obviously, bigger clubs will be on bigger money, etc. Yeah. But um, they've changed the rules, so you've got to stay in education until you're 18. So, with our scholarship, we did a sports B Tech. Um, sort of like around mainly sports science but also a bit of physical stuff a bit of coaching stuff so it's a it was a proper mixture um but doing it being a level three one you're still eligible eligible to go to university so obviously they have to include that as a backup plan uh, yeah. if you don't get a professional contract um and then sort of after that you probably know if you're going to get a pro they usually do decisions around march in the second year um obviously if you're an outstanding one like we had morgan roberts a few years ago got his pro in April of his first year. Wow. So his pro carried on his second year scholar and then two years after that. Um, so you've had a few lads that are like that, but most of the time the decision is around March in your second year and then you know you sort of speak to the club about what they're going to offer you and how long for, etc. So okay, so how old are you at that point when you like normally get your pro contract? Uh, usually you're, well, 17 or 18. Okay. Is so that what, were you 17 when you got yours? 
No, I was no, I was eighteen. I'm eighteen in Feb, so yeah, I was. I was eighteen when I got mine. Um, I got it in May, so yeah, May a year and a half ago. Okay, and then it ends this summer. Cool. Um, what's it like being in a in a football academy? Obviously, like you you live and breathe football, so it's obviously the ideal. You're just doing football all the time. Um, when I was having to think about the questions, I was sort of thinking it must be difficult going through that whole process with a set of lads, and then naturally some lads don't make it. Um, yeah, no, massively. There's there's you know, it's lads I can remember that I've been playing with since I was sort of seven, eight, got all the way to sixteens, and then didn't get a scholarship. And it's like you know, you formed a proper bond with them guys. Yeah. Like some of my best mates are people that have been in the academy for years and, and you know don't play football anymore. Mm-hmm. They're doing whatever they want. Like we had a lad who's now roofing, who was in my scholarship, who I'm good friends with. Like, we got a few lads that just, you just find a different career path and yeah. it just takes you elsewhere, really. Yeah. So, like, um, the school side of it, what's that like? Do you do it at Cobblers or do you go off to, like, an external place to um, do it? Yeah, we, they used to do the education at the ground in a, they have an education centre, so I'm at the back of the ground. Um, but the lads on the BTEC, well, the football and education programme do that yeah. there, I think. And they also do it at St Crispin's where we do it. Okay. Um, so, yeah, our usual for the scholar week, it was, you know, you train Monday, Tuesday, do education after train on a Monday and then all day Wednesday and then okay. nothing until the following week unless you had catch up work to do. Then you do that on a Friday. Okay. So it was a pretty set. It, was, it wasn't sort of shopping and changing. It was a very set sort of formula that we followed. Yeah. And what was your like view on the whole education stuff? Obviously, I would imagine there's some lads that, they sort of bank everything on football, so they don't really care about the education side of it as well. Like, how did you view the sort of mix of, of learning and playing football? No, I think it's important. You know, you, you, learn, you might learn things. You never know what you can learn. You might learn things that help you impact on your football, that, you know, whether it's diet. Th- so, obviously, we did a lot about your physical well-being. So, that whether that's muscle recovery, whether that's dieting, whether that's sleep. There's loads of things that we learned on that course that could help you. It's just, you know, whether people choose to do it or not. Mm. Um, but I always think it's valuable to have something behind you, even if you back yourself to the hill to go and be a professional. Your professional career only lasts till your mid thirties, yeah. late thirties, if you you know take care of yourself extremely well and you get fortunate with injuries. But you've got to have something to fall back on, especially later as you get older. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, what about uni? Is that a thing that a lot of footballers do? I know when we interviewed um, Ollie from the Saints, he was saying that there's a few lads that sort of play rugby alongside a university course. Yeah, is that yeah. a thing in football? No, there's a few well? lads that do it. Um, Scott Pollock was doing it last year. Okay. There's a few lads that, um, you know, they go to open universities, so obviously they can work remotely and then go in, say, three or four days a year for certain exams and things like that. So, mm-hmm. no, they're, they're quite flexible nowadays with doing uni as well as profession because, um, you know, you can be flexible with it doing your free time. You've got the same deadlines, but mm-hmm. you just do it after training. So, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it's an option that I'm debating looking at. Um, I really want to go into coaching after my career, so I'm okay. looking to sort of try and start getting on my B licence at some point in the near future. Yeah. So that's sort of the way I'm looking at the minute. Okay. How long does that stuff sort of take to get into coaching after football? Is it something you have to start thinking about really early on to be able to do it when you retire? Some do, some don't. Um, you know, there's some lads that wait till their late 20s, early 30s before they even consider going on their B licence. There are some yeah. lads that get on it when they're you know, 22, 23 and have got their A licence by the time they're 25. So mm-hmm. I think I'm looking to go down that route just because um, I want to set myself up. You never know what happens in football. Yeah. You could get a freak injury. You could just fall out the game. You could lose favour. You could just lose enjoyment of it and yeah. just not want to do it anymore. So no, I think that the coaching licences, they can provide you with information that helps you on the pitch. It just gives you a different look at the game and you can pick things up that you might not expect to ju- by just playing. Mm. So I think it's an option. Uh, again, it's an option that I'm going to take and I'm going to do moving forward. Okay. Do the club sort that out for you as well if you are if you do that whilst you're contracted? Uh, it's all done. It's usually done through the PFA. So, um, you know, the, they have PFA reps that run areas. So obviously we're in the mid- south of the Midlands, so we'll use the Midlands rep. Um, and you sort of speak to him about what options you have. They normally run the courses in the summer, so you could, you know, get started, have your um, initial enrolment. Um, they do sort of set up hotspots, so sometimes it's in Georgia, sometimes it's at various other clubs, and they'll do um, like an intensive for, say, four days. And once you've done that and sort of got the main teaching bolt, you go out and get your coaching hours up, and then people come and review it, and you might have a couple of performance sessions and things like that mm. um, to make sure you're, 
meeting the criteria and the quota of doing that beat license. Right, okay. Just going back to uh, like when you're in the academy, did you did you ever have a point where you thought like I might struggle here to get through to get through to the first team? Like I don't know if maybe you know a player that you viewed as better than you might have got dropped or something like that. Did you ever have a point where you thought, right, oh, shit, I might not uh, get yeah, through here? Uh, um, I was sixteen to get my scholarship actually. Um, yeah, sort of up until about fourteens, I was, you know, in my head I was thinking, no, I'm 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 doing all right here. Yeah. I'm I'm looking at this. And then sort of 15, 16 was a, was a tough period for me. I didn't, I had some time away, not through injury, just through sort of um, like, because this was when, uh, this was probably my dad's third, fourth, maybe fifth season at Burnley. So we used to go on holidays and international breaks. Mm -hmm. But obviously that took me away from my football. So I did miss a lot of time, you know, weeks of time, which obviously bad on my part. And I yeah. understood why I got taken out of the team and things like that, because, you know, it's something that, I took time out of going from football um, and I wasn't really old enough to stay by myself and not go on those holidays and but we didn't really see them that often so yeah. it was that was that quality time that we missed we were making up um, but yeah 15s and 16s wasn't really playing regularly sort of was maybe back end of the season last seven eight weeks because um, the scholars get their uh, they get the scholarship decision sometimes to do early ones around November and then they do the rest of them sort of the same time as the pros, sort of March time, February time. Um, so around that time when the second years, say, got their scholars, uh, they would go off and train with the current 18s and then the younger lads would get their opportunities to play later on in the season. So that was sort of my place at that point. Um, and yes, sort of six, my 16 year, I didn't play too much in the first half of the season. And uh, yeah, a couple of lads. I thought, okay, they're you know, I think they're going to get one. Got dropped at Christmas, and it really shocked me. I was yeah. like, wow, okay. Um, and from the early decision, I wasn't getting one. And then just sort of uh, Gaffer when he was the 18s manager, and I was yeah, my 16s invited me to train with the 18s over the Christmas period, the holiday period, because mm. he wanted to have a look at me. Um, and then I trained with them. Was was playing games for the 16s and training with them when I could, because obviously they were scholars, so they were in during the day when I had school. So when I could train with them, I was. Um, and then, yeah, literally got one a week before the end of the season and was cool. absolutely beside myself. So. Yeah, I bet. It must be a really like, high-pressure time, that, when people are get getting their scholarships and there's lads that are thinking, am I going to get one, am I not? It must be a real sort of nerve-wracking time for the whole team, really. Yeah, I mean, it's different for everyone because you know, each person's situation is different. So some of them have let's say, slacked off their education and have chucked all their eggs in one basket and just fully gone for the football side and then they don't get one and they've, you know, sort of hung themselves a little bit. Mm. So, you know, there's a, there's, yeah, emotions are running high and because obviously at that age, it's everything. Yeah. You know, still at my age, like, I just want to be a footballer. So mm. I want to be in the game as long as possible. Yeah. So, you know, in that, when you're in that chasing for that scholarship, it's the be all and end all, like nothing else matters. You're like, right, I've got to get a scholarship. So, you know, I, I was waiting, just playing and playing, finding out, like, while I was doing my GCSEs. So, you know, I was taking time out of revising to go and train and go and do extras and stuff like that. But that's because I know when I knew I needed to. And I knew that to give myself any chance of getting one, I had to do that. Yeah, yeah. So when did, um, when did your, like, debut come for the first team? It was in my second year scholar in the start of December against Crew at Crew. Okay. Um, yeah, Keith Curl gave me that. We were we lost the game two one in the end in the ninety fifth minute. We I came on because we got a red card, um, and came on in the back five just to literally just see the game out. I think that was about fifteen twenty minutes left, maybe, and they scored with like the last kick of the game. We were all gutted, um, and then yeah, actually one of the centre halves got suspended that game, so I ended up playing in the following game against Oxford United, and we got pumped four 0 but. Yeah, as much as that sounds like yeah. a bit crap, and yeah, everyone was feeling a bit crap. I was, to be honest, I was just buzzing. Yeah, you've just you've been on the pitch. Yeah, care, right? Seventeen just years old playing in League One, like, I was <laughs> on top of the world. Yeah, no, that's cool. What like what sort of emotions did you have before you when how, um, like when did you find out you were going to be making your debut? I didn't. I found out when I was warming up. Oh really? So I was in the squad for a couple of weeks before that. Um, I think the, like the two previous games, um, we'd had a couple of injuries in the first team, so they asked me to go up because I was doing well um, for the youth team. And yeah, I was, I was warming up. 
um, down the sideline and saw the guy get sent off and I was just warming it down the sideline and just, just see him turn around and say, you coming on? Wow. I sprinted down the pitch, like I sprinted down the side of the pitch, <laughs> like heart racing, like scrambling, give my shirt, give my shirt. Because um, this was during COVID, so it was when you were allowed 2,000 or so home fans in, no away fans. So like we were sitting on the bench at Crew, but we weren't sitting on the bench. We were sitting behind it, like yeah. in the bottom of the stand, because they wouldn't let you sit that close together. Okay. So obviously I'm scrambling, saying like, give my shirt. But obviously the lads are like, well, I can't really, yeah. can't really touch it and all that sort of thing. So I'm <laughs> jumping over the thing, just grabbing my shirt and running down to the sideline. <laughs> um, but no, it was as m- as much as it was crap to take the defeat and and the manner we did, it was you know, it's, it's a day I'm going to have forever. Yeah, yeah. What about that first start? How did uh, like how did they tell you you were going to be doing that, and, and what were the emotions in the build up to that game? Oh yeah, it came so quick afterwards. I was just again, I was just buzzing. I didn't I didn't really have a care in the world. I was just like, well, I'm going to play in League One again. Yeah. I'm absolutely beside myself. That's um, cool. Yeah, that game was on a Saturday, and the second game at Oxford was on the Tuesday. So Monday, I found out. Wow. Um, we did team shape, and he was just like he put me in the starting team, mm-hmm. and I said, around I said, well. I'm normally, I'm normally on the other side. I was, yeah, I was beside. I was just, I was really confused. And then obviously, like he named the team when he lined us up, and we did some shape play and some set pieces and stuff like that. So I knew I was going to play. That's cool. Um, but yeah, I was just, it's just, yeah, just really excited. Were you able to have family in at that, at that game? Yeah, my whole family came actually. Yeah, oh, cool. Um, yeah, my my dad, my mum, and my sister all came to that uh, at that Oxford game because obviously they knew I was playing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was great to have them in the stands. Like. It's always it's a proud moment. Must have been really cool, especially. Well, I love when you hear people that have been at clubs since they were like nine years old, and then you go on to make your debut for the first team. That was a pretty cool thing. Um, no, it's, yeah, it's proper. I mean, I supported the club when I was when I was little. Yeah. Obviously, when you start playing from you know my scholarship, it's sort of different. You can't really. You can you can, but it's not the same feeling. Yeah. Um, it's more you know pride in yourself and. Um, and what you're doing rather than being a fan of the club, so to speak. Um, but yes, you know, it's my, my boyhood club and I've been here for such a long time. It was really great. Yeah, it was yeah. top. Cool. What's it like being a, a teenager in that first team environment with the, the older lads, probably lads that you might have watched play even when you're like a proper young teenager? What was it like going into that, like the first team changing rooms and all that? How were you welcomed in and what sort of environment's well, it like? We've generally had pretty good groups the last few years. You know, we haven't really had any proper acid players or, or spiteful players of young lads. So everyone's been pretty cool, um, you know, because they've all been there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've had a few mixtures of players. So we've had a few lads come in from, uh, you know, sort of 23s environment. So they're similar age to me. Um, we've got a few faces uh, that are new this year that I've cracked on with straight away. Mm-hmm. Um, so, they, yeah, they don't really, it's not so segregated, I would say. Um, you know, if you get involved with the old lads, respectfully, of course, you can't. You got to know where your place is. But yeah. you know, they're they're not exactly going to push you away and, and ignore you. It's not sort of as precious as the as the old times used to be, where it was yeah. very much. You know, you've got to really earn your spurs before you even get a look in. It's sort of okay, you're welcomed into the environment, but you've still got to know your place. You've still got to earn your spurs. Yeah. So you're not like cleaning the strikers' boots or anything like that. No, not <laughs> the minute. But you know, putting the, tidying the kit up, helping <laughs> yeah. helping yeah, Antti yeah. out, moving the goals, stuff standard like that. Stuff. Yeah, making all the balls as yeah, standard stuff. Yeah. yeah. So just moving on from uh, from like your young start to your career, um, you spoke a little bit about your dad. Obviously, there's loads of questions I could ask you about your dad because he's a proper legend. But um, like, just tell us a little bit about him and and sort of what impact he's had on your career so far. Well, as you can imagine, a, a big one. Um, I think the one that comes under the radar is my mum, actually. Really? So, yeah, because, you know, dad lived away a long time. And well, it's good to have him home now. But, you know, for, a, well, from when I was 10 until 18, he lived away from home five days a week. So, you know, we didn't get that much contact time. Yeah, um, so for anyone, to watch if anyone's real. listening that doesn't follow football, obviously your dad was Burnley manager whilst you were down here so what was he up there the whole week and then yeah so he'd say like <coughs> he'd uh, go up on a Monday for training uh, come home on Tuesday night and then he'd stay up until he'd go back up on a Wednesday uh, Thursday morning sorry and then stay up until the weekend and come home after the game on a Saturday so okay, it was a very long week and you know my mum was the main one that was there all the time picking me up taking me to training and yeah. like all those days I felt like crap when I come home because I'd train crap and uh, you know I wear my heart on my sleeve so if I she knows if I've trained rubbish. Mm. Um, so no, it was, it was 
you know, she, dad's obviously had a massive impact on my career. He's, he's taught me everything I know. Um, also being nurtured at the minute by Cole is amazing. Someone with unbelievable experience that can offer and play center. I've played, you know, 500, 600 league games, managed at the top level. Like yeah. he knows what he's talking about. So I've got him and my dad giving me the tactical and technical side of the game. And then, you know, my mum giving me a bit of an arm around the shoulder when I need it. Yeah. And that was a big thing, especially going through that rough sort of time when I wasn't playing as much at 15, 16. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, she's a bit of an unsung hero in that, cool. in that little story. Do you feel any pressure like having a dad that's done a lot in professional football and is still like at the top of the game? I used to, big time. Um, I felt like everyone looked at me with an expectation when right. I was younger, sort of probably 12 to 14s, maybe 11s to 14s. Everyone, I felt like everyone around me sort of thought, because my dad would sometimes come and watch training on Tuesday night, so he'd sort of be there in the background and then they'd look around and sort of expect a lot from me, like expect me to be a wizard. Um, so there was a bit of that, um, but I've been with it for so long that I've I've got used to it now. So it's it's just another thing that comes with the name, really. But okay. it used to affect me when I was a kid, and it used to I used to put pressure on myself to perform because of him. Yeah. Um, but obviously now I just look at myself and put pressure on myself because I want to have want to have high expectations and high standards for myself. Mm. Is he is your dad critical of your game, or what's he like after you play and he's and he's watched? No, we'll have we'll have debriefs about it. Um, you know, he won't He won't sort of just sit there picking fault and going, you should have done this, you should have done that. It's more like he asked me what I think and then when he's listened and digested what I've said, sort of give me some feedback based off of what I've said. So he might agree with some things, he might disagree with some things. Um, yeah, we don't, you know, we don't sort of sit there for two hours and properly break everything down, but... Get the whiteboard yeah, out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, get the tactics board out. But um, no, we'll have a chat and stuff in the car on the way home from games and games he's been to especially like he went to watch um he's watched me on the papa john's game so far so you know when we're in the car on the way home after the game we'll have a chat for 20 minutes or so but mm. yeah we, we certainly don't get a tactics board out and sit there for an hour and a half having a meeting i guess like probably for him as well like he's so involved with football i imagine when he watches you like he could just talk for hours about like this is what you could do better this is what you've done well but I guess like trying to keep that father son rather than just football football all the time. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it naturally comes into the professional side of the game, but I think that we both knew that it would. Um, but he does no, he does well of, of not imposing himself because quite as you said, he could quite easily sit there and we could you know digress about everything um, and sort of pick out bit by bit. But we we have sort of general conversations and he's. You know, he's, he nitpicks, but that's because he knows I need it. Um, but he's not, yeah, he's, he's, the biggest thing for him is not trying to impose. So we have a sort of tough chat sometimes about, okay, so he really wants to come watch me. But then when he watches me, you know, people ask him for pictures and stuff like that. So it's tough for him because he really, obviously he really wants to watch me. I want him to watch me as well. Um, and my whole family do. But then when he's getting mobbed, it's sort of, he feels like it takes the spotlight and puts it on him while, like, you know, he wants it to be on me and the other lads that are playing so yeah it's a, it's a bit of that and we've had a you know we've had to have talks about that and just sort of you know be, be ready for it basically because it, it just comes and it always will be, it'll always be there yeah have you ever had any negativity about it or any stick from opposition or any like banter from the people oh, in your team yeah loads uh you know every day <laughs> um yeah it's just I'd chew a bit quick. I'm learning to shorten my fuse, but I'm, I'm a quick nibble. So <laughs> the lads get a bit of enjoyment out of it. Um, they usually, they know that if they mention him, it's a, it's a free comment. Um, so there's a, yeah, there's a bit of heat being thrown around the change room, but it's, no, it's all, it's all in good faith. They, they know that it's, there's not, we've got a good group. There's no moody stuff being thrown about, but yeah, I've, I've got stuff about it through everywhere, school. Mm -hmm. It's just something that comes with it and I've had to grow thick skin through it. You ever had anything from opposition players? No, not so far. No, no I haven't haven't had too many, but I presume I will get some <laughs> as I progress. Hopefully, as I progress my career. <laughs> Just like, like something I've wondered, you, you get a lot of managers that tend to like when they go into a club, especially when they've got like a young son, they'll bring their son with them to the club they're at. Has that ever been an option for you with your dad? Um, no. Yeah, I'm going to say no. Okay. Um, you know, I sort of I went through my scholarship program here, and then um, 
when ending my scholar, I had a, you know, there's a couple of clubs looking at me, and um, you know, they have to. The, the rule is under 24s have to pay compensation for. So, um, also we spoke to the club, and, and when we sorted out my pro contract about that, um, and obviously I ended up staying. So yeah, there hasn't really been a situation where that would happen, but I'm not sure that either of us would want that. I mm. think that, you know, from my perspective, I think that if I went to the club, my dad was at. You know what everyone would say already. Well, yeah. brilliant. Your dad sorted you out. Fantastic. Um, and, you know, he'd probably get a bit of pressure from the other lads. Like saying, oh, you're playing your kid and all that sort of thing. So it's yeah, sort of like of the course. Steve and Alex Bruce situation. Yeah. Like, you know, he'll. I don't think he'll ever live that down about that. Especially in that situation. When he was at Hull mm -hmm. with him, I think that, you know, he would have got a lot of heat off the other lads and, and yeah, probably definitely. the fans as well about that. Definitely. Just going back a little bit to, like, uh, you playing... You said you've had like a couple of times where you've struggled a little bit with with not playing, or like you had to come home and talk to your mum about like frustrations you're having. What sort of stuff do you have in place to deal with having a bad game? Well, I mean, I'm quite fortunate in the sense that I have a really close relationship with my family. You know, some people don't, so they have to turn to you know that maybe that's their mates, maybe it's just them. Just I call it literally just chilling out and just whether it's you know you talk to your mates on. PlayStation or something for an hour, like something just to diffuse the situation. I think if I've ever, if I'm ever really emotional about like not playing well or if I'm ever you know beating myself up a bit too much, I just do something else other than football that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So it might be like going out and like just going out, yeah, just literally going out, having a blowing up a bit of steam with some friends, um, going on PlayStation, having a little mess about with the with the lads. So yeah, so there's a few things, but you know it's it's. Staying level-headed as best you can when you're in that situation, and that's a really tough thing to do, especially for young people. You know, yeah, of course. Especially looking at performance in football, and not just football, but every sport. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you get down on yourself, and you get really critical of yourself, and you know, you, you're always your worst enemy. Yeah. So I think being level-headed and balanced is a tough thing that you know people just got to learn. What are you like now with your performance? Are you really critical of yourself? Yeah, very. I think that I want to get to the top, so. I only see high expectations and high standards, so I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know why I'd sink myself below that level. No. Um, yeah, very critical. I think that, you know, sometimes I'll come home to my my parents and say, "Oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. I should have done this." And they're like, "Okay, but you did this well and you did that well." So, yeah, I think even sometimes I have to look at the, the positives a little bit more and sort of get hung up on on certain negatives in certain situations, and they stick with me a bit. And that's yeah. something that I've obviously got to learn to move past. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's you know it's something I've been working on, and you know self doubt always creeps in when you're when you're not playing and stuff like that. So you know it's just trying to stay strong mentally and, and stick with what I'm good at and stick with what I know and just looking to keep improving every day. Yeah, cool. Are you glad you went through like a little bit of a tough patch when you were going through the sort of scholarship phase, and it wasn't all just plain sailing the whole way through to. No, I, I am actually. Yeah, now you, now you say that, yeah. I think that if I'd have gone through and it'd have been, you know, easy o's, you know, I've been playing every week and all that, I think I'd have lost the edge. Yeah. I think that you need an edge to, to succeed in anything, like whether it's sport, whether it's business, you need, you need an edge to, and a real want. And I think that having that taken away from you for a little bit really ignites the fire in you and, and you really find out how bad you want it. Yeah. Um, you know, some people fall away and crumble and, and that's the end of them, but some people really push on and attack it and I think that I did that well and, and took advantage of that. Cool. Obviously a, a big part now with with sport and with like sports people um is social media and the backlash you can get on social media. What are you at are you are you on social media? Do you pay much attention to it? Um I don't pay attention to it in the sense, you know, I won't sit there after a game looking at the Chronicle and Echo reviews and stuff like that and, yeah. and looking at fans' comments and stuff. I don't, I don't do that. Some people do that, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think it does anything for you really. I think that, um, you know, you got to be careful with what you digest on social media. There's a lot of, in, there's a lot of things that can cloud your judgment and can sort of get mislead you and, and throw you off a little bit. Um, you know, I think that everyone and people in the environment, it's their job to be professional. They know what they're talking about. So, um, you know, I think getting too obsessed over the social media stuff is is something to be wary of. Um, and, you know, just focusing on knowing what you're good at, knowing what you can, you can have a little self breakdown of the game and how well you've done. But, you know, talking to your coaches and things like that and even your teammates as well. Mm. I think that's probably the better way to go about it. 
Definitely. Is there guys that do come off the pitch and they're straight on their phones looking for what what opinions people have got of how they played? Not that I've noticed. Um, yeah, you know, there might be a bit of banter thrown around. So, you know, if, if someone's had a bad game after everyone's called off, um, they might, you know, go on Twitter and stick something in the group chat. Like they've yeah, seen yeah. Some, a, a fan slating them, for example. Yeah. Stick it in the group chat for a bit of a laugh. But yeah, there's nothing... You know, there's nothing malicious. Like people don't come for each other, and people I don't I haven't noticed anyone really searching. Well, not Northampton anyway. I haven't mm-hmm. noticed anyone digging anyone out for that, or yeah. or going online and searching for negative things on the, or positive things about their own their own world. Everyone just sort of you know stays in the environment, knows where we're at, and, and sticks together as a group. That's good. I don't I don't really know what Northampton fan base is like, other than my mate Matt, who's a fanatic. But um, I know with a lot of other teams. Generally, a lot of the like shit that players get from their own fans. I know I support Leeds, and Leeds fans are like some of the worst to our own players after a game, rather than like, opposition fans sort of taking the piss. What's like the interaction you've had with Northampton fans so far? Well, personally, it's been pretty positive. Um, I think our way supports Ledge, mm-hmm. um, especially this season. Um, Leighton Orient is probably the biggest one, and it was last year as well. I think we had fifteen hundred come down, and that was that's good. That was really good. Yeah, when we beat them last year at their place, um, Mitch scored a rocket, and yeah, it was a that was a proper game, and you know there was a proper you could tell that they really enjoyed that, and there's a proper support going on there. And we, you know, that's that's something I think that, especially the way support in particular, I think something that the club prides itself on. And yeah. You know, as as lads, there's nothing better when the f- you you do example win a ball and go on a counter attack and all the fans are screaming behind you. Like it's it's just a good feeling. Yeah, yeah, it is. It this town's like so big for sport, isn't it? You've got obviously cobblers, saints, and the cricket, and everyone. Even if you don't follow football, I'm a Leeds fan. I follow Leeds, but still, I want cobblers to win, even though I'm not necessarily a cobblers fan. I've yeah, been to a few the- been to a few games with Matt, and when you're there, you can tell that the fans are so passionate about it. Yeah, I think that the town the town's really massive on sport, especially you know the Saints are a really successful rugby club. The the cricket clubs are really good as well, the county cricket. So, you know, you got a really small town. Well, it's semi big, but it's obviously not a city. Mm-hmm. Um, you got a town with three big sporting clubs in it um, that you know everyone goes crazy for. So, no, it's a it's a good it's a good town to have a have that sort of environment in, and I think that it reflects that, but particularly in the away support. Yeah. So staying with social media, obviously you've got the the side of social media where like sports people have to deal with the negativity and and some of the backlash you can get. But also, like you've got to be very careful what you put on social media as well, haven't you? Because obviously like, you're representing Northampton Town Football Club. So, um, like, how have you you dealt with probably not being a normal like teenager, eighteen year old, and like some of the stuff that I might put on my social media when I'm out with my mates drinking. You probably wouldn't be able to. Yeah, you got to be careful about that. Yeah, his career's been ended on that. Sort and everyone's of always got their camera out, haven't they? When they see people, yeah, you know, it's 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 sort of it's putting yourself in the right environment with the right people. Um, obviously, certain situations can't be helped, but you can do the best you can to be aware of you know what you're doing, what you're saying, who you're with, um, especially with posting stuff. That's why you normally see a lot of footballers' accounts are really safe because. Yeah. They don't really know. There's a lot of grey areas where, especially with the whole like people getting offended thing, like mm-hmm. it's. I think it's gone a bit crazy at the minute, and I think that people are really careful with what they say and do because if they set off the wrong group, it can get you in trouble seriously. So, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a weird situation, social media. But you know, it's it's one of them things. It's really helpful and it's it connects people. Like well, it's connected us tonight. Yeah, exactly. But, and I think with people listening to this podcast as well, but. There's also, you know, sort of people that some people can be out to get you and yeah. you've got to be really mindful of that when you, especially when you're letting yourself loose a little bit. Of course. Have you had, like, what, what's been your thoughts when you've, like, turned 18 and you've been able to go out and you might have mates outside of football that, like, want to go out on the beers and stuff like that? Have you, have you always got it in the back of your mind that I need to be careful here, I need to, like, not take it too far? Not really in the sense that I'd pick the right group to go with. So if they if the lads said they go if uh, some lads I knew said they're going on a night out and there was a couple of lads there that I either didn't know or sort of was a bit wary of I'd prob I'd definitely drink less yeah um, I think that if there's a group that in a, I mean a setting I'm comfortable in in a group that I know I can trust then you know I'd, I'd let myself go a little bit more 
But, you know, everyone, I think everyone has that thought, not just sportsmen, but, yeah. you know, everyone has that thought. You, d- you never know what people are doing and, and what people's agendas are. Mm. Um, there's a lot of moody people around nowadays. So especially in that situation, I think that everyone's careful and weary. Yeah, Ol- Ollie said a similar thing, just to, like, draw parallels between, like, you and you and Ollie. He said he's got, like, a group of mates from school and he's just sort of kept that because he knows that them lads have got his best interests at heart. He doesn't really tend to bring new people in because he knows that the group of mates that he's always had don't care that he's a professional rugby player. They just want to be within his company. No, I agree with that. I think that it's, it's really important that you know who your real friends are. And, you know, as he said, as he said, he's got a good group of mates from school. Yeah, I think that's the best way to go about it because they've known you for so long that they really, they, yeah. they don't even look at you like that. You know, people you meet who are new, you have to make judgments on whether you think they're on side or whether they think that, they're a little bit moody, or they've got a, they've got an agenda here, um, and that's that's tough, you know. Especially as a, a young, even not even a young professional, even in any sport, even in, if you're doing well, say you you know you go into a law firm or something like that, you might be doing really well in that, and you might have a bit of money coming in, and you know people people have agendas. It doesn't matter what you do, you, you've got to be careful about who you trust, especially nowadays social media. Definitely. Like people can be very two faced, and and a bit keyboard warrior. So yeah, you got to be you got to be always mindful of that. Definitely. In terms of your, of your footy, have you ever have you had any other setbacks in terms of like injury or anything like that? I've been quite fortunate with injuries. Um, yeah, I've, I've, I pride I pride myself in taking care of myself and, and looking after my diet and my recovery. Um, I think that's really important, especially for looking at longevity of a career. Um, but yeah, I've been quite fortunate. I know a few lads in my youth team have really struggled with certain injuries, and it you know it can throw you not off your game, but it can throw you off mentally. Like yeah. in being injured is tough. Yeah, especially for you know, especially for long periods. Like we've had a few lads like um AJ who's just come back who's who's been out for a long time. And you know, it can affect you. Not like being away from the group, but also just not doing the thing you love. And, you know, just sitting around, going gym and, and doing this and doing your rehab and not doing too much because you could aggravate it. So yeah, being being injured is probably one of the hardest things, especially as an athlete, because you just take a step back from what you want to do all the time. But mm. that's where I go back to having hobbies and having a little backup plan so you know some people might then at that point crack on with their uni work or you know th- um, invest themselves in other hobbies they've got around it so I think it's important to have that cover on the off chance that something does so really well yeah cool um what sort of like support do the cobblers have in place for players or, or just football in general from what you know for stuff like um you know signing new contracts and obviously you're in professional sports, so the nature of it is you're gonna probably <clears throat> probably sign contracts where you're gonna have you know more money than people your age generally would. So, what sort of support do football teams put in place for young lads that you know might just get signed a new contract that's a lot of money, sort of thing? Well, we have um, our safeguarding officer at the club, Julie, who you know she, especially with us younger lads, does sort of regular check-ins and, and make sure that we're doing all right. Um, we got the PFA that come in and do talks about various things like that um obviously I'm quite fortunate in the sense I'm close to my family so you know and my dad being in the environment for so long we we naturally talk about that sort of thing and sort of look at where look at where it's at look at what I think is is fair and what he thinks is and sort of stuff like that but um you know in terms of the club there's a lot of the staff are quite open about talking about that um especially I've known the staff a long time because they all got promoted from the youth team. So I've known a lot of them for sort of four years or so now. Um, but you've got a lot of lads that have been around the game for a long time. And even for us young boys, I think that, you know, there's there's plenty of people around the club that, to talk to if we were in trouble. Cool. And there are plenty of people that want, you know, that have our best interests at heart. Yeah. Uh, do you think that sort of goes for the senior lads player-wise as well? Do they sort of... Are they there for, like, if the younger lads have got questions about their new new contracts or whatever? Mm, it's a hard one. I think that it depends on, you know, an individual's relationship with another. Um, it's Yeah, it's not like I'll just walk up to one of the senior lads and say, oh, what do you think of this? And just show them my deal. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not really like that. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's quite private in terms of that situation with, with football, especially talking about contracts and things, because it's all personal. You know, so you might be showing... You know, say say I showed someone my contract and then they don't get a deal at the end of the season and I do that's you know there's a bit of yeah yeah so yeah I mean it's it's quite private and personal in that sense but um you know there's there's plenty of people the PFA offer a good service to talk to 
Um, and I've been in, in a fortunate situation. I just go to my dad and just say, look, I've got a question about this. And he goes, okay. Yeah. Um, but there's, you know, as I said, Julie at the club, there's a lot of backroom staff that put a, a lot of work into supporting us and making sure that we're okay physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have no doubt that if people have questions that they could go there. Is that this, obviously you said you've not really been injured, but is that the same for, for when you get a long-term injury? Is there stuff the club put in place for mental health and stuff like that? Well, yeah, they try and, you know, we've got, we've got the mental health officers at the club and, and Judy does a good thing with that um, personally, like for herself. Um, she comes on and talks to us regularly. Um, but yeah, for the injured lads, it's, it's tough. Um, they try and do their rehab around the group. So obviously they'll still come, when they do their rehab, they'll come in and have lunch with the lads and... Okay. You know, they might try and get them in the gym at the same time or, or if they're on the recovery group, they might get them in the re recovery group at the same time just to try and keep them around them as much as possible. Um, but obviously that is tough because, you know, training works on different schedules sometimes. Um, but no, you know, injury, injuries can be quite an isolating time and I think that in particular the club, you know, you know, here we do a decent job of trying to keep people around the group and not sort of seclude them in their own little environment. Mm -hmm. Cool. So going forward in your career, what's what's your sort of ambitions for the next like four or five years? Do you see yourself staying at Northampton? Do you see yourself trying to sort of push on through the leagues? Well, I mean, it all depends. Personally, it all depends on you know, it all depends at my age on game time. And being a young centre back, it's tough to break into a first team. Um, everyone knows that centre back is one of the toughest positions for a young player to come through purely because it's it's you got to have trust in your defence at the back and. You know, it's a tough thing when we've got such good defenders at the club. Um, obviously, Skip, John Goffrey, who's been had a, you know, illustrious career and was in the team of the season last year. Um, uh, Shares has come in and Tyler McClure and stuff like that. These are good players that come out of 23s at a high level. Um, and AK come from Swindon's, played over 100 league games. And, and Harv as well, who's my age, who's come in and done really well. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of competition at the club. And I think that looking to the near future... Depends on if I play or not. Um, obviously, I want to. I'm really hungry, and I and I want to get in and amongst it, um, and get my sort of career off the ground and, and really push to play. But um, yeah, I've, like my career aspirations, I want to go to the top. Um, no matter how I get there, I will get there eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's just it's just biding my time really and seeing what comes around and, and how far I can take it. Yeah, cool. And just to finish us off, uh, what advice would you have for for a young lad that might be in a football academy, maybe in the position you were in at uh, 16s where not getting as much game time as they'd like, but they really want to pursue football further. I think you've got to have a look at yourself first. I think that people who people who look around and point fingers are people that aren't going to make it. I think that you've got to look at yourself first. You've got to really think about, take a good look in the mirror and think about what you want to do. And if, if you really want to go and be a professional in anything, it, you know, in, in sport in education, in business, in anything, you've got to back yourself and you've got to really decide, right, okay, if I'm going to do this, I've got to give it everything. There's no shortcuts and cutting corners. You're going to go all the way and you're going to do everything properly with every every bit of energy you've got. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for your time, mate. Um, I think your outlook for a 19-year-old is pretty, mate, pretty mad. So, um, yeah, I wish you the best of luck for, for the season and for the rest of your career and with the support that you seem to have around you, I think you'll do brilliant. So thank Cheers. you for your time. Thanks, Thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you for watching the latest episode of the Lessons Podcast. Please like, comment, subscribe and interact in any way you can. Also follow our social media channels at student.dot. That's student D-O-T. Thank you.